everyone and welcome to the Koala Club Podcast, a podcast made by and for international students in Australia. I am Kevin. And I am Trang. And we talk about everything education, work and lifestyle for overseas students in Australia. Hi everyone, welcome back to episode 8 of the Koala Club Podcast. Hi Kevin, how are you? Hey, good, good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. What are we talking about today? Today we're going to talk about very very related and I think useful topic given the timing. The topic is going to be choosing the right course for your study. So we're going to guide you on how to choose your course and what are the factors at play here that could affect your decision and how to make it your good decision. Well, when we say course, we mean like a broader field of study, like engineering or commerce. So Bachelor of Commerce or Bachelor of Engineering or Bachelor of IT. So we, we don't mean the actual major, which is your specialization, like civil engineering or accounting. So just be mindful that we're talking about the overall course that you will be applying for at university. Just before we start this good episode, I reckon uh, we have some major news coming up. So do you want to share with us the first one, Chan? Yes. So the first one is hot and fresh news from today. So the New South Wales Premier has just announced that there will be no hotel quarantine required for returned Australians and residents. And this will be at the initial stage. So I think this is a really good step in the right direction. And because if they're abolishing hotel quarantine for Australian residents, then hopefully one day they will abolish that too for international students and tourists. So definitely good news coming out of today. Actually very surprised today to hear this news from the New South Wales Premier. And uh, to clarify, at first he did say that from 1st of November, all return travellers, including even tourists, that is fully vaccinated can enter New South Wales and enter society without the need to quarantine in hotel or even quarantine at home. But after that, we got a little clarifications that initially this will be only available for return Australians and Australian residents and Australian citizens only first. Um, but we're talking like from the 1st of November. So 1st of November, if this happened for Australian citizens and Australian residents, I can't imagine it would be long until others, people like tourists or international students can enter the country without hotel quarantine. Mm, yeah, things are definitely moving very fast now. Australia and New South Wales is slowly opening up. Okay, so do you want to tell us the second hot news? Well, the second hot news, uh, some may say it's even more important than the first news, <laughs> that um, um, we are famous. Um, well, we, we got on a radio channel, not, not really, we got on, we are going to get on a radio channel live. Um, that is a local uh, radio channel in Wollongong, in the Illawarra region, I should say. It's called ABC Illawarra. And uh, in Australia, the channel number is 97.3. When this episode aired in probably two weeks later, we probably already got on the radio. So this is more like a back to the future thing. I'm just going <laughs> to clarify. We're going on the channel live in two days on a Monday morning at 6.45. Yes, exactly. On Monday the 18th. We're going to grab the, the little uh, episode back when it, after it, it aired and maybe we can share on our podcast Facebook or Instagram. Yeah, for sure. So keep your eye out for it. Yeah, or, or ear out as well. Ear out, radio. yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So should we move on to the main uh, part about mm-hmm. the episode? Yep. So for this episode, we're just going to make it more structured. We just divide into three sections we're going to talk about. So at first, we'll talk, discuss the factors that are determining your cost choice. And then we're going to talk about the sources for your research. Where can you do your research? Uh, that can affect your decision and uh, at last we're going to help you build up like a action plan to put all this into actions yes so we will run through some factors impacting what courses you choose but this is by no means not ranked in any order so we're just listing them out and it's quite a general list as well and obviously each individual would have different circumstances so take this into account but i'm sure like everyone has personal situations to take into account as well. So the first thing we want to mention is interests play a big part in choosing your course choice because 
this is what you'll be studying or learning about. So you want to be passionate about it. You want to have like a big interest in this area that you're studying in. And later on in your career, you're going to be working for what, like 40, 45 years until you retire. So you should probably work in a field where you have passion for. Do you agree? Yes, definitely. I mean, you know, with the old saying, if you're doing something that you love, you never work a day in your life. It has its true, you know, saying, uh, if you study something that is you're not interested in, but you only do it because say you hear that the money is good after you get a job or something that your parents want, for example, you're probably not going to follow it right to the very end. And you're probably not really motivated to uh, do a good job at it. So yeah, we always recommend go with something that you're interested in. Mm, yeah, motivation is definitely a big factor when you're studying and it keeps you going. So definitely choose what you're interested in. Okay, so our next point is go with something that complement your own strength. So say, are you good at all the STEM subjects? For example, like math, physics, chemistry, or if you enjoy more creative ones like arts or graphic designs, when you combine your passion and your interests with what you are good at and what your strong points are, then you will probably have a relatively easier path in your course or your study journey. Mm, Yeah, definitely. So the next point is career prospects. So you need to think about what opportunities are there for you after you graduate in your home country and in Australia as well, because throughout your three or four year journey in Australia, you might decide that yeah, you want to keep staying in Australia and work here, or you want to go back to your home country. So research the career opportunities that are available in both places and know that there is like sufficient demand for the area that you're going to be studying and potentially working in. And I guess there's a realist view as well. Um, we did mention that you should look at interest and your own strengths, but being in a very um, capitalist uh, economy in the world. Very, very harsh and competitive world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So money is important too. So mm. you need to think about the earnings potential. So how much can you make out of working in this field or pursuing this career? Yeah, I definitely agree. For example, in my case, um, when I decided to study civil engineering, I take into account both of these points, which I believe uh, I did some research and well, civil engineer or the construction and building industry in general will always be good in both Vietnam and Australia because uh, both countries or anywhere in the world will always need construction, will always need to build new infrastructures, new building, new structures. So the job potential there is very good. But also I, I did have to take into the realist view which is the earning potential um, for a civil engineer in Australia from what I do a research is quite good but in my home country which is Vietnam is actually quite bad at least in the beginning stage when you like a young engineer and you got out the hours working hours and condition is uh, grueling in Vietnam is really really harsh and the earnings uh, potential at least in the early stage in Vietnam is not really good at all. So I kind of have to like stick with my decision in that, uh, which takes us to the next point that I kind of decide that I will try my best to stay in Australia and work in Australia because that's uh, what I want. Before we go with this next point, we have to make a disclaimer that we're not uh, giving away any immigration advice, right? Because we literally, we just uh, not qualified to do it. And we don't so make your own decision. Uh, this is a general, general opinion, okay? So with the immigration prospect, you need to kind of uh, have an idea on whether or not the immigration prospect is important towards your cost decision. Whereas you choose a cost because it uh, can help you on your path to stay in Australia in the long term and live and work here as a resident or as a citizen. Would you agree, Chad? Yeah, for sure. Like it is a really big factor though. If you decide that you want to stay in Australia, um, then you probably should decide this before you start your course or before you apply so that you know which fields to study. And you may have heard of the skilled occupations list. 
So this is pretty much like a hot occupations list. Um, it's the occupations that are high in demand in Australia, and that will give you, I guess, more points or more preferred applications to get permanent residency in Australia. And obviously, there's a lot of visas and a lot of types of permanent resident visas that are out there. So uh, do your research. But there is a list called Skilled Occupations List if you want to Google it. And I did did Google it today just to see what's on the list now because the, the, the list does change yeah, from time to time. Um, but today I saw stuff like roles for accountants, uh, for a diff- few different types of engineers, very interesting one, a horse trainer uh, and plumber. So just to name a few. So Google it and see what's on the list. And I think even now they have uh, tallers as well, which, uh, you know, it's a really good profession, tallers or chef. So yeah, just make your own research. So it's skill occupation list or SOL for short. Okay, so the next factor is the money. So how much you're actually paying for your course. And obviously, this would depend on which university you end up picking. Um, But the range can be, and it also depends on the course as well. So the range can be anywhere from between 25,000 Australian dollars to 55,000 per year. And this is subject to reviews and increases every year as well. So That is obviously a major factor in deciding which course you want to pursue and maybe which uni you want to do the Mm. course. Some of the fees between unis do vary and it also depends on the rankings of the uni and where the the uni is in terms of location. So definitely do your research because the fees can vary and be wary that it can increase um, every year or every two years as well. So financial matters is definitely something to do careful research about before you make a big decision it's like a major investment right in yourself you're paying good money for it so yeah it's definitely worth uh, checking on the fees of uh, the different costs and the fees from different unis different um, college different organizations that can offer you the choices that you can choose from so i just want to jump ahead one point and link it link it to this point which is the duration of the course because it related somewhat to the fees as well Mm -hmm. so like you know if you look at the fees for example bachelor of commerce or bachelor of nursing we have uh, three years full-time study if i'm not mistaken Mm -hmm. something like an engineering course which is like for example civil engineering could take four years and then if you do a a double degree could take five or six years you know, the longer the duration of the course, the bigger the fees you pay at the end as well. Yeah, definitely a big, big investment. One of the biggest investments you're making in your life, really, your education in uni. Well, that takes us to the next point, which is sort of interrelated, is the scholarship opportunities. There are lots of scholarships on offer from the universities or from the government do your research to see what scholarships are out there because that definitely do help with paying the fees and yeah, reduce the expensiveness of the course of yes. study that you're going to pick. So, I mean, this is not a, I guess it shouldn't be like the deciding factor. Like say if my passion was in commerce, but only engineering had scholarships, then obviously it wouldn't sway me as much. It, obviously, if I had like the financial backing to study commerce but yeah so definitely do your research to see what scholarships are available and we will um, be be moving on to some of the resources where you can search for uh, scholarships too but for sure in the future we will do an episode on scholarship opportunities so a Mm. more detailed episode on this yeah definitely I just want to add one uh, last point about scholarship opportunities as well is that you're right, it shouldn't be the deciding factor for you to completely change uh, a course from something to a totally different thing. But it could be, say, a deciding factor for you with, say, a, a uni offer a better scholarship or more scholarship in reduction of tuition fee, for example. And then if that, if that uni offer the same course, but in slightly different, say, title or different path, or slightly different major, 
you can actually consider it because at the end of the day, when a lot of the jobs, you know, uh, in real world, take applicants from a variety of different uh, courses per se, if that makes sense, like a civil engineer, um, uh, someone with um, an environmental engineer degree, but if they uh, have the uh, necessary experience and if they have the right passion, right attitude, they can probably still be accepted in the civil engineer role. Um, so that is something you can um, consider as well to choose your course. Yeah, I completely agree with that and can relate to that too, because when I was applying for the Bachelor of Commerce for a range of unis, University of Wollongong gave me the highest scholarships and that was a big factor in me picking the university. And I still remember my uncle telling me this when I was picking between universities because obviously there are other universities in Australia that are highly ranked in Australia and in the world as well. Mm -hmm. And I obviously wanted to go for higher ranked unis, but my uncle said something which I still remember to this day. And he said, it doesn't matter which uni you go to, because if you go to a uni that's not as highly ranked, but you perform well and you perform like at the top of your cohort, then that makes all the difference. And when you apply for jobs, in my experience, I don't think employers have really discriminated against which unis you have graduated from. So that's just from my experience. And I I definitely don't think that if one uni doesn't offer a scholarship, but is highly ranked, then you should go to, to that one instead of another one that is maybe lower in rankings, but gives you the scholarship, then that would definitely help you and your family too. Yeah, completely agree. When I got accepted into my uni course, I also chose uh, Wollongong Uni because uh, the deciding factor was I got the most, uh, the biggest scholarship out of uh, them rather than other uni. But uh, the same thing you said, um, sorry, even if if my financial situation was not that tight, probably would still consider Wollongong seriously because uh, Wollongong Uni is, has a very good reputation at producing good engineers civil engineers or mining engineer or any engineering related courses is actually their strength. So you write about the part where it doesn't really matter which um, uni you go to. It's not the most important factor, but um, what is the most important factor is yourself and how you conduct yourself in your study. Yeah, for sure. And that's not to mean that what I meant was University of Wollongong is not highly ranked. It is highly ranked, but Mm. there are more highly ranked universities than Yeah, <laughs> just to make that clear. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I think we are in the one percent. Last time I checked, we were in the one percent. Yeah, one percent. You know, it's pretty Top high. Of the world, so that's pretty yeah. high. That's that's high enough for me. <laughs> yeah, high high enough for me too. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's move on to the next part where we talk about uh, where you can do your research to find the right course for your study. So I'm gonna kick off with the government job outlook website. Uh, we link this one in the show notes as well. You can have a look, but the website called joboutlook.gov.au. So that was joboutlook.gov.au. They have listed pretty much all the job title you can think of. And then you can read about the jobs itself, say what a civil engineer does in a day. And you can read about the job prospect. You can read about all this statistic, all this medium salary range, for example, or the popularity of the job itself in Australia. So you can know if there's a high demand in that area or not. It's a great website. Have you looked at that website, Jan? Yeah, I had a look today. So I wish that someone told me about this website when I was researching what courses or what areas to study because I did not know about this website, but it's a really good website by the government. It's actually a very cool looking website and it lists out all the jobs and industries with the high growth potentials. So like high demand uh, occupations or industries. And there's actually like a career quiz as well that you can try. So it you can just pick like your areas of interest and then basically the system will give you a list of occupations based on your interests and what you picked. And it also lists out, like, again, as Kevin mentioned, like the growth potential of the occupations and the average weekly pay too. So it's like a one source um, resource for all these occupations. 
Another government website resource that I also found today, which I also wish that I found earlier when I was researching for my course. I don't know if this website was um, made at the time, but this one is a website specifically for Australian international students. And again, we'll put the link in the show notes. But if you want to look it up, it's studyaustralia.gov. So that's G-O-V dot A-U. Again, a very cool looking website. And this is like a consolidated search tool. So you can put in your field of study that you want to look at, say business or health or education, and then just click search. And then it will list out all the courses for all the unis in Australia. So it's a really good resource because you just need to look at one website and see all this instead of going to like 10 different websites and 10 tabs and click back and forth. I also found that this website, you can search for scholarships all in one place too. So you can pick the field of study as well and then pick your nationality and then click search. And then it will list out all these scholarships from all the unis. So I'm not sure if this is a comprehensive list, like everything, but it's definitely worth looking at. So it's definitely a good starting point if you don't know where to start or what you need to look at first or Google is too overwhelming. (laughs) Then have a look at these two websites. Have you seen this one? Yeah, I haven't seen this one, but I wish I I knew about this as well. Like really, when we were searching for our courses, we didn't know about this. And the only thing we know, probably the next point will be the website and uni. And of course, each different uni will have to sell their courses. So, you know, probably all the things you read there is good things. And it's, it's always good thing, but it's more like subjective per se. Whereas this government website gives you a more objective view and a more a view from the third person. So not really trying to sell you anything or trying to sell you how to, to, to come over straight to study. But, you know, you get the very objective view of this job outlook and also these different costs from the government. I feel like these are very valuable and provide a, you know, much needed different perspective for students. Mm, yep. Definitely agree. Definitely very useful resources to check out. So our next point, come back to the old-fashioned traditional way that we only had at the time. Well, <laughs> we, we have had other, but we don't, didn't know better. So that is the uni website, which is a cost fighters. And they are actually getting more and more informative by the day. I actually had a look at, you know, our old uni's, uh, Wollongong Uni cost fighter website um, just today. And I was actually pretty uh, pleasantly surprised by the amount of, you know, informations is a better outlook, it's a better content, the whole thing. So it's actually very informative and all courses listed out uh, of search by area of your interest. You know, it tells you the details about the course, the course handbook, the duration, the fees, the structures, the different majors. And if you want to look at the career pathway as well, They do it all. So I still think this is a very informative and valuable source that you need to check out. I feel like it gives you like a feeling of how the uni is like because different unis have different ways of presenting their website and presenting their courses. So it definitely gives you a vibe of how that uni will feel like. Yeah, and also on the uni website, it can be your second point. First, you look at those government websites we've just mentioned, and then you see that, okay, University of Wollongong, University of Sydney has these courses, so you can go straight to the uni website and have a look at those courses. As Kevin mentioned briefly, we can look at the course structure, and you can actually see what subjects you will need to complete to finish the course, and obviously that also depends on the major as well. It gives you a guidance of what to expect in your time doing the course and there may be core subjects that might not be directly related to your field like say when you do a bachelor of commerce you have to do all the commerce subjects in the first year so it's good to know like what to expect and what is waiting for you I guess and that can help with your preparation as well. So the next point we want to share is you can do your research on forums on online or on Facebook groups so I think forums used to be a big thing in the past i think it's yeah. it's still popular but i think facebook now is getting more popular so google i guess um whatever your field of study in australia so i guess bachelor of engineering in australia students or something like that and that will come up with 
I guess a lot of Reddit forums or Facebook mm. groups where people are discussing their course and how they're finding it. And feel free to join those Facebook groups and post your questions. And they would have like thousands of members and surely someone would get back to you with their valuable insight as to how they're finding the course or do they enjoy it, what you should know. So definitely use those online resources from real people. Well, hopefully they're real people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like those are cat videos on YouTube, typing keyboards, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the next source I feel is uh, your own network or the people you may know. You know, you can find those network, especially the uni alumni. So people who already completed their course or the courses that you want to study in that uni in Australia. So you can really find out exactly how they feel like about the course and also how they feel about the delivery quality of the course from that uni. So I reckon you can find this relatively easy from LinkedIn, per se. So that's that's the first tool coming to my mind when I talk about this. So you can actually literally go into LinkedIn and you can put in a future option of um, you know people working in this field, like a civil engineer, for example, and uh, graduated from, say, for example, Wollongong Uni. Yeah, I think most people would be very happy to help. And even linking this point to the previous point about Facebook groups, like there would be Facebook groups for uni students from a particular uni. And you can join those Facebook groups and just post like, has anyone done a Bachelor of Commerce from this uni? What is your experience? And people would be very helpful and they'll just comment and give you what you need to know. So, and it's a good way to make friends too. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so I guess our last point, it's not very relevant for future students, but more so for current students. So I think most unis would have career advisors. So either in the faculty or within the general uni itself, so a department for it. So reach out to them if you're a current student and well, hopefully you don't have a change of heart in your course midway through and decide on changing your career. But they're always there if you want to talk about uh, future career prospects or what to do if you really do want to change your course. I think this reminds me of another point, which is a more traditional way, which is at career fairs. So, you know, pre-COVID, we used to have career yeah, education yeah. fairs. Yes, yeah, so- that's like a million years ago. Yeah, it does feel like a long time ago. That's why we didn't. I didn't include it in the notes, but I just remember about it now. But when I was researching about coming to Australia and what courses to do, I attended like the education phase that we had in my home city. So I met the people from like the recruitment staff from each university and they may be able to just give you general career advice, but it's still good just to get that vibe from the uni and see what courses they offer and get a whole heap of brochures and come home and just have a read through it. So definitely good once COVID's over. Yeah, I think I came to some of those uh, career fairs as well. I have to agree, it's very informative and you get to meet uh, alumni or current students there and you get to meet people who work in the recruitment space with international students for a long time. So they are very knowledgeable uh, about all, all things international students uh, and for your questions. And it's just that, uh, you know, human interaction that is so nice that we are missing so much now with the COVID situation. So hopefully, you know, we're getting back on track on that soon and hopefully those career fairs can happen again soon. I just realized that uh, I just say career fair a lot. What I do mean is actually not career fair. I think I meant uh, education fair, which is, you know, these um, sessions where we talk about uh, study, study path and courses for future international students. Thanks for clarifying, Kevin. I'm, that's all good. We're all human. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the final sessions of today's uh, episode. You know, now that you know the factors that determine your course choice and where to do your research, now it's time to put in the work and build up your action plan. I guess we might just want to say that this is just like a sort of a general action plan. So you should tune into our next episode where we're going to go over uh, the step-by-step process from applying yes. to getting to Australia. So mm. that will be a more detailed episode. But here we're talking about, I guess, getting ready and getting geared up mentally, I guess, to get ready to apply for these courses. 
So the first point is you need to look at what the course's entry requirements are. So each uni would have slightly different course entry requirements. And when we say entry requirements, we mean like the IELTS or TOEFL score, so the English language requirement, and the academic score requirement. Most unis, if not all, would list this out on their website. So when you look at the course you're interested in and go to requirements or admissions, they will list out the English language and the academic score requirement that they require. So that's the minimum, I guess, benchmark to get into the course. So that will give you a very good idea of, okay, what do I need to aim for and what do I need to achieve in the next few months? Do I need to ramp up my English skills? Do I need to revise for IELTS and get that test done? So do I need to uh, study harder to get a higher academic score? So it's definitely worth looking at to see where you should be aiming. Yeah, definitely. And it's worth doing this because that way you can kind of prepare yourself early. And let's say if you look at a course and say, oh, this course need a 6.5 overall IELTS score, for example, then you haven't got an IELTS score yet. You can start, you know, uh, practicing or learning your IELTS aim for to achieve this uh, required 6.5 uh, mark. The earlier you look at all this, the better, because if you want to get into a Australian uni in two years, for example, you can start, you know, studying IELTS and then probably you can get your IELTS score even one year uh, beforehand, because I think for academic purpose, the uh, IELTS score lasted for two years. So you can apply to a course within two years of your IELTS score result. Um, so the next point here I want to say is you have to consider uh, whether do you want to apply for a scholarship or not. This is more like a step up from the last point, which is just your course uh, entry requirements. So to apply for a scholarship, obviously you have to meet your course entry requirements already. So you, if you probably have that already, and if you really want to aim higher and get these scholarships, you need to find out what are the requirements for these uh, scholarship applications? So for example, you will probably most likely need a statement of purpose or personal statement as in to um, stating out why or your purpose of doing this course and why I should give you the scholarships. And you might need a referees check. So you might need to ask someone you know, someone you work for or some of your teacher or professor that teaching you to give you a reference uh, check and maybe a reference letter or introduction letter. Any social activities or achievements, requirements for that scholarship. So all of this, you know, is really a lot to take in. I think you need to look at it like, you know, a year beforehand at least so you can start preparing this stuff. And uh, we will also talk, um, you know, scholarship in a more, much more details future episode. Yeah, I definitely agree. You definitely need to look at this a little bit earlier than two months uh, before you start applying because it is very overwhelming and I would suggest even looking at it like two years earlier when you're looking at the course requirements you might as well check out okay what do I need to do to get this scholarship and what scholarships are available and definitely pushes you and motivates you as well. So the next point we want to share is to start preparing and researching about the skills and knowledge that would be required for your chosen course. So it will sort of give you a head start. So like, for example, if you wanted to do something in business or accounting like me, then you could prepare by attending some Excel courses and just uh, upping your Excel game and get you into that advanced Excel yeah. level instead of beginners or intermediate. And that will already give push you ahead in front of your cohort, in front of other students that will be applying at the same time. And you can mention that in your statement of purpose, personal statement. Yeah, so that's from my end. But I think, what did you do to prepare for yourself before you applied for those engineering courses, Kevin? Um, I started reading about engineering in general. So back then, I wasn't um, exactly reading about civil engineering because I believe at the start, I applied for mining engineering in Wollongong Uni, uh, and I got accept accepted into a mining engineering course, actually. So I was reading about all sorts of engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, and mining engineering, and uh, what it is like 
to be uh, those uh, engineers and what it is like to be an engineer in general. It doesn't have to be a dreadful exercise. I think I follow like an Instagram or Facebook page of say, trust me, I'm an engineer. And they got a lot of these funny photos and memes. So I start reading about all these famous uh, civil structures uh, around the, uh, the world, which in Sydney, the most famous one, probably the Opera House in Sydney. Um, it's fascinating, you know, reading about all that stuff. In a way, it kind of gives you a head start, but also kind of prepare yourself mentally, you know, to, to say to embrace the cost and not feeling like a big of a shock, you know, in in terms of uh, the study material or whatever that they throw at you in these courses. Yeah, I think it's a really good exercise to do. Yep, very creative. I like it. Yeah, and the next point I want to mention is it's probably also worth to prepare or learn new soft skills too that could help you in your course. So this does not have to apply to any particular course. This can be a general thing for people. This soft skill we're speaking of is like anything from daily tasks like cooking to something like public speaking or debating skills or working in groups. I guess you will find the study culture or the way of study in in Australia, especially in higher education, like university level, is really, really different than the way you study in most countries, in your home country, for example. This way of study here, I found, is very active way of study, whereas you have to take a lot of the initiatives and you have to be quite confident in yourself as well. You have to, you know, throw yourself out there. You have to present stuff. You have to present your idea. You have to protect your idea, which leads to debating. And then you need to communicate your ideas clearly in a group so that others can understand you easily as well. And then you can work well with a team to produce a good result as well. Do you feel that way, Chan? Yeah, definitely good idea mentioning that, Kevin, because I guess some traditional education systems, like say the Vietnamese education system, uh, it's very different to the Australian education system. So you might not be like debating, doing a lot of presentations when you're in the Vietnamese education system, but bam, you're in Australia, you're doing your uni course and you're thrown in the deep end and have to do all this whilst cooking, cleaning and everything for yourself. So I guess it's good now because like there are a lot of opportunities, professional development opportunities out there in uh, in Vietnam and I'm sure in other countries as well for young people, like young teenagers to get involved in. And it's definitely a good way to throw yourself out there and acquire these soft skills and learn as much as possible before you um, move yourself to Australia and sort of, yeah, start your uni course and be in a new environment and having to learn all this and adapt to this by yourself too. So preparation is key. Yeah, exactly. I think that's it. Yep. So we've covered factors determining your course choice, where to do your research, the, the sources, And then we sort of gave you an action plan to start, I guess, two years earlier. So hopefully that has been helpful advice. And yeah, next episode, we will delve into further, I guess, further into in the timeline from applying to arriving. So this episode is one of the first in, you know, a series that we want to introduce to you guys that could really be very informative and could really help shape your preparation for your you know amazing journey to study in Australia and we really hope that you enjoy it we certainly enjoy you know putting work into this thought and it's in a way it kind of make us relieve our years of uh, you know when we were so young and so full of excitement to come to Australia right like I mean we, we're not old now but uh, older <laughs> yeah <laughs> and older yeah exactly and I, I really really miss you know, those days when, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to come to Australia to study. And I guess it's the same excitement, this feeling of eagerness and exciting for our listeners. Hopefully these episodes will really help you in your path with that. Great. Thanks for listening, guys. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please share with your friends. And if you haven't already, like and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at The Koala Club Podcast. Thanks, guys.